Right. Thank you very much for staying. And I'll try to shout a bit louder if I can. And I'll ask you to, to talk about the evidence for and against stenting in patients with connective tissue disorders. And I thought about it, what to talk about it. Um, these are my closures. Actually, um, that will be it, and we can go home for, for our dinner, actually, <laughs> because uh, very, very little evidence, and definitely level one evidence to, to support either way. You know, people are trying to use indirect evidence to, to support their practices. Nevertheless, we look at a few things that we, we should, and incidents of thoracic aortic aneurysm and dissections um, Every time they do the population studies, and you can find it's increasing. But saying though, I was told by vascular surgeons that there's an incidence of abdominal aortic aneurysms are reducing. And maybe because of the statins and, uh, and secondary prevention. So we, we need to look at that. And we know more and more about genetics. And then so, so we know more about the family of thoracic aortic aneurysm dissections and their association with um, uh, Marfan's, Louis D's, vascular elodenlos, and Turner's syndromes. And then uh, there are more and more patient these around in, in our aortic, um, aortopathy clinics. We are seeing these uh, horrible GOE gold standard operations. And, and um, Lars has just shown the kind of very, very extensive kind of the whole aorta replacement to the open surgery. And then that's been a whole standard that we all been kind of accepted at for four years. But since uh, around 91, when Jerome Barodis introduces um, infrarene or kind of AOD stenting, the, the dream of a minimal invasive, minimal access, and then the non invasive, really, well, invasive, but for, for the stenting is coming in place. And subsequently, from Stanford, and they published a paper about the thoracic endovascular sten sten grafting in '94, and that in the about 14 patients had that um, thoracic aneurysm stenting. That's led to 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 expansion of thoracic endovascular sten grafting, and more and more all over the world. Simple mid-descending thoracic aortic aneurysm with a decent lenizone proximal and distal. Stenting is uh, by far probably the simplest and probably lowest kind of risk procedure for, for patient nowadays, and that has changed. And we have many thoracic endovascular endov uh, stent graft available nowadays. And branch stent grafts, fenestrated stent grafts, and then them coming kind of more and more kind of come into practice and you're seeing a hybrid uh, arch repair with a kind of open surgery and there's a stent graft kind of together. Or the, um, the way that kind of Cleveland Clinic do, does it, um, their um, frozen elephant trunk type of procedure. There are a variety of ways of using stent graft in these surgical these aortic aneurysm patient dissections. And now more recently, more branch arch stent grafts are coming in. So, so we have more and more facility available for, for stent grafts and to treat these patients. So when you look at the evidence for endovascular treatment in acute and chronic aortic pathology in Marfan's, and the paper they've seen, patient, 16 patients on the, in the paper, 19 patients underwent the TVAR, EVA, and they come to the conclusion that endovascular treatment can be used as adjunct or a bridge to open surgery. And subsequently, kind of more recently, systematic review by um, the um, Pichy David Pichy, eh? from, from the Roberto's group, uh, has a review, systematic review of 12 papers. Combined 12 people come with 54 patients. And out of that group, 81% of the landing was uh, system graph was landing in the native aorta. And then 1.9% dead, and the CVA 1.9%. And then paraplegia was similar incident. And conversion to, to surgery was only 3.7%, um, but endoleak was uh, 22%. What it shows is uh, endovascular treatment can be performed in these patients with a low risk 
a relatively low uh, complication rate, but uh, trade trade is uh, endo leak and subsequent reintervention problems. We've seen a look for the paper. There was a paper for Ehlers-Danlos syndrome with 26 patients over 16 years time period, and 48 procedures performed at very low late complication rate, about 2.1%. But this is over 16 years from the one group. And so the evidence, when you look for it, is quite difficult to find. So what's the problem with the connective tissue disorders patient? They're young. They have weak aortic wall. And so it is uh, when you have a kind of stem graft with um, metal kind of spikes, the chance of tearing, retrograde type A dissection, and subsequent, even they don't have a dissection, subsequent false injuries in these area when they have a trauma, or the aortic expansion in the, around the peri stent area and lead to late endo leak subsequently. And the complication of these aorta okay, is quite quite smaller size. And there are quite a lot of patients have type A dissection at a size less than 4.5 centimeter. These are a group of patients that we're talking about. And they require multiple intervention in the lifetime. So, so there are the multiple problems associated with them. So retrograde type B dissection has been quite, quite not being, being discussed before. And it depends on the CV. It's a measure. It cannot present it between 1.3% to 6.9%. Not as high as we expect to. But once you have a dissection, retrograde type B dissection happened to descending kind of uncomplicated type B dissection. And then type B repair in the internationally, mortality is around 20, 21, 24%. So uncomplicated medically treated and type B dissection with mortality of less than probably 10% or 5% can be converted to over 20% uh, following type A repair or retrograde type A. So they need to be considered. Appropriately, and they they have complicated kind of problem, and they they come back with the kind of in interposition ascending graph, and come back with a kind of subsequent root aneurysm, distal arch, and descending aneurysm, and septum calcify. So so variety of these they, they, these things happen, and then this patient had the previous ascending. And you can see the root, and they can arch complicated section, and all the way down. So, so these patients have a kind of multiple problems. So, so when you're trying to kind of look at the evidence for, for, for and against for stenting for this kind of patient group, it's not straightforward. And then many of those patients that we are seeing in our clinics, and that they are not ideal for, for endovascular stent grafting. And then pliability of these uh, septums. This is a patient with a septum remain pliable two and a half, three years after initial dissection. So, so what are we think traditionally that after about nine months or so, there will be kind of no more pliability or septum? That's not necessarily true. So we can treat that kind of patient with endovascular treatment as well, possible. So, so we, we need, there are so many factors include, in, involved when you, when you cannot uh, come to interpret the outcome of the kind of, uh, treatment modality. And we all seen it with the explosion of T-bar for, for Tybees. And they have this uh, distal and the leak and continue expansion of false lumen and subsequently lead to, to either a subsequent stenting and the coiling to, to stop the kind of endo leak or maybe the open surgery. We had this one young kind of patient who was a lawyer and they was uh, executive and the director, a member of the board in the hospital. Had the previous group for Marfan, open repair for infrarenal, and then open repair for TAA with a visceral patch and become a visceral patch rupture, ended up with kind of uh, multiple kind of stent graft. And then despite of that, and the rupture part of the stented aortic section, the segment and require the subsequent redo descending and the arch replacement probably about 18 months ago. So, so this is the total natural history we've seen with these patients regularly. So what's the role of endovascular therapy in these patients? We, we heard about the kind of to save the patient is more important than doing the gold standard operation sometime. So maybe that I would say 
To expedite the repair, to make to save the life, it's more important than, than kind of to, to, to go standard treatment sometime. And then trauma, so, so trauma patient rupture aorta, and they're putting it into vascular stent grafting is good. I think that will save the life, bridge to kind of to for surgery. Exclusion of patch aneurysm, or treatment of the kind of complication from anastomosis, which is failures, which is the right thing to do. And the key principle of success in endovascular therapy in these patients is stenting across between graft to graft. Open either surgical graft or stem graft. So you have a solid proximal landing zone, solid distal landing zone, inadequate length. And that will then help you to have a kind of reasonable success in these uh, therapies. Then we all heard about the frozen roll of frozen elephant trunk. Even though we said well, there's not a lot of evidence, but think about it, quite a lot of patients who have that type A dissection are the patient with connected tissue disorders. So this is indirect evidence that we are producing and over recent years. It provides a proximal learning zone for the TIVA, or you can clamp a repair, it's an open repair afterwards. It certainly kind of helps with the remodeling proximal descending thoracic aorta. And they're suitable for second stage either kind of technology which is that's a reason why it's becoming more and more useful kind of two devices. But you need to know the device, either a Vita Open Plus or the kind of Thoraflex and a hybrid system, whichever will be useful for individual patients. And this is one example, uncomplicated type V dissection. And this is uh, but treated with a TIVA. Patient was uh, an event for discharge, and then eight weeks later, came back for clinic for the routine follow-up, did the CT scan, shows the retrograde type A dissection already, and subsequently expand. So the patient came back, so that we did kind of the mini sternotomy and the frozen elephant trunk into that um, TIVA and treated and replaced the ascending and then kind of frozen elephant trunk. So, so having these uh, devices help us to, to, to treat these patients in a more uh, effective way. And, but uh, when you look for the evidence to, to either way, to fro, pro or the con or the for or against, is there's no clear answer for that. Which Lars has shown that his um, expert consensus, we clearly say that kind of for these patients with connective tissue disorders, endovascular stent grafting is, should be limited to the patient with a high risk for open surgery. So I'll conclude by saying there's no substantial evidence for or against stenting the patient with connected tissue disorders. And the lack of long-term outcome data and the increased reintervention rate uh, at present and then make us to, to, to stick to the principle that at present therapy should be limited to patients with high-risk surgery and also to, to save the patient's life and therefore bridge to open surgery. Thank you very much.